Safari of the Africa Corps in 1933, the year I turned nine years old, Hitler swore in his first personal guard unit, the Leibstandarte SS Adolf Hitler. This swearing in was the forerunner of the Oath of Allegiance sworn by every man and boy inducted in the German armed forces, I swear to you, Adolf Hitler, as Führer and Reich Chancellor, loyalty and bravery. I vow to you and those you have appointed to command me, obedience unto death. So, help me God. By 1939, Germany formed an alliance with Italy called Axis Berlin, Rome. The following year, Hitler and Italy's Mussolini concluded a tripartite pact with Japan. Opposing this triumvirate were the Allies, consisting of England, France, the Soviet Union and the United States of America. By 1942, the German army drafted all the boys in my age group. I ended up as a private in the Africa Corps, one of Germany's elite military units. They used me as a replacement and shipped me to Tunisia, Africa, to fight the Allies. 1943. The smell of budding spring in Tunisia's Atlas Mountains teased my nostrils, even as the ground vibrated like an earthquake under me. Hundreds of Sherman tanks rolled toward us. The Americans had us under attack. Within seconds, noise like metallic thunder shook our foxhole. Come on, boys! Come on out! An American yelled from a tank rumbling close to my foxhole. I flattened my nose into the dirt. I thanked God that even in our haste, my buddy Klaus and I had burrowed deep into the rolling, semi-arid terrain of the Atlas foothills. They want us to come out to surrender, I said, quickly translating the English for Klaus. I could barely make out his face through the dust, although I was close enough to smell his breath. What should we do? I asked him. This was more than a rhetorical question. The word was, if you didn't fight or worse, deserted your own officers would shoot you without question, without thought. A private first class. Klaus outranked me. I thought he would know what to do. In my mind, he was an old guy, at least thirty. I was a scared kid of eighteen. He should take responsibility. Klaus seemed oblivious to this logic. Klaus, see what's going on, I said, nudging him again. By this time, I had to shout to be heard over the mechanical monsters roaring above us. His blue eyes widened in terror in his dirt-caked face. Are you crazy? I'm married. I've got two kids, he said. Why don't you take a look? Because I'm the brains of this team, I'm not doing it either, I said. I wasn't going to stick my head out and get shot. Of course, the Americans wanted us to surrender, but who knew what they had up their sleeves? Klaus and I hunkered even lower, crouched together at the bottom of the hole under a blanket of dirt. The shrieks and grinds of the tanks battered my eardrums. The sides of the foxhole vibrated like the skin of a kettle drum. I pressed my hands over my ears to shut out the noise and the reality above me, men killing, men dying. Finally, the clamour of the tanks faded. Shots and shrieks replaced the metallic horror. I lifted my head just enough to see. A dust fog covered the ground and allowed faint sunlight to penetrate the field of death. Several feet away, over the edge of the next foxhole, a couple of dirt-covered guys, their eyes wide, stared back at me. I was incredulous. They were alive. I was alive. The dust drifted to earth. Sweat and tears stung my eyes. I blinked furiously to clear my vision. In the distance, the entire Allied force disappeared in a storm of dirt. I pressed my ears to stop the ringing. They must have thought they wiped us all out, I yelled to Klaus. How many are left? A voice called out. I'm here, the soldier across from me shouted. Two here, I responded. I spat the dirt of Africa out of my mouth. One by one, other voices echoed across the earth in the now silent foothills. As impossible as it seemed, the enemy had overlooked us. All of the survivors had a story to tell about their close calls. Most of our unit was captured or killed by the enemy. From our straggly band, I found out that a few of our group had fought back out of duty. 
The Shermans crushed most of them right in their foxholes. The rest had been rounded up and taken away. Klaus and I soon figured out that if our full infantry unit had resisted, the Americans would have taken the time to mop us up. Sweaty, grimy and tattered, but basically uninjured, several dozens of us gathered together. We knew that the British and the Americans were somewhere around us. Our supplies, including food and gas, had run out. Our cause seemed nearly lost. There was also another factor to consider. Instead of, we'll fight to the last man, the edict drummed into us grunts from the very beginning. The attitude had changed. Our remaining officers seemed more concerned about saving our lives, if possible. I didn't know it at the time, but the change had come from the top. In the bitter eleventh hour of the war, Hitler had sent a stark order to our Kohlengeneur Jürgen von Arnim. The German people expect you to fight to the last bullet. Von Arnim put his own spin on that order. He told his officers, The last bullet shall be the last shell fired by the last tank. Then we will destroy our weapons and Army Group Africa will give up. Our little band of survivors pulled itself together. An NCO, non-commissioned officer, took the lead. We wanted to find a way to the coast. There, if luck was kind, we could make our way to Italy by commandeering boats or planes. Little did we know that thousands of our fellow Axis troops had thrown down their weapons and were streaming toward Cape Bon on the Mediterranean in a spontaneous, leaderless procession 80 miles long. There's an old proverb, man thinks, God laughs. Our plans now seem foolish, but at the time we stragglers had no options other than to fight or to surrender. But surrender to what? That we didn't know. We waited for darkness and headed north through cactus-covered foothills. Our bedraggled troop followed a railway track in the hope that we could avoid the cactus thorns and poisonous scorpion bites that had plagued us. We couldn't stop or rest. Come daylight, we would be vulnerable. Out in the open, we'd be targets for the next attack or strafed by Allied planes. American air power had grown more awesome every day with the virtual disappearance of the German Luftwaffe from African skies. Low-flying, strafing American P-38 and P-40 fighter planes with cannons routinely attacked. We were told we had a new weapon that could inflict incredible damage on the enemy, the new German Wunderwaffe, wonder weapon called Nebelwerfer, after the German inventor Nebel but the six-barreled rocket launchers came too late to win this battle for us. Following the railway track and ducking for cover at the least sound, I carried the usual gear, rifle, sidearm, water canteen and first aid kit. My stomach rumbled. We had eaten the last of our food the night before. Despite my hunger, fatigue, sore body and aching feet, my youthful energy carried me to the front of the line. Darkness fell accompanied by the now familiar chill of these desert regions. We trudged for hours through the night. Near dawn, we spotted one of our German anti-aircraft units hastily burning papers and destroying anything that might benefit the enemy. Limping severely by then, I hobbled up to a couple of the younger soldiers to satisfy my curiosity. Turned out, they had drawn the same conclusion we had and were also headed for the coast. They took pity on my sore feet and offered to give me a ride on their half-track anti-aircraft personnel carrier. Hastily, I looked around for Klaus, shouting for him to join me, while my new buddies hoisted me aboard. He spotted me and understood immediately. So did everyone else. Klaus gave chase, but others overtook him and scrambled aboard. As he faded into a dot in the distance, I wondered if I'd ever see Klaus again. From there, our small band merged with a huge gathering of Axis units and stragglers, ending up somewhere on the Cape Bon Peninsula. Thousands of men swarmed together. Like a river of humanity, we flowed to the coast. Near the shoreline, our forces had stored an enormous amount of food and munitions, including goodies that had never gotten back to us in the field. News of the stash rippled through the river of men like eddies in whitewater currents, stirring up discontent and disillusionment. Obviously, while we were eating cold rations, the rear echelons had been eating well. Much to my relief, 
Klaus caught up with me shortly after the transport stopped at the edge of the stockpile. Like a couple of kids, we ran around the pile of supplies, finding choice cans of meat and vegetables. Using my trusty army issue can opener, I pried open a can of sardines and shook the entire contents into my mouth, letting the oil dribble down my face. With great whoops of delight, Klaus opened up case after case of chocolate and alcoholic beverages. I gorged myself on canned beef, peas and chocolate, while I wondered what would happen next. I looked fondly at the sea. It sparkled invitingly. I'm sure General von Arnim has boats and planes waiting for us, I told Klaus. The signal for our rescue is probably already out. Yeah, he said, and my name is Trudy, and I'm vacationing on the sunny shores of the Mediterranean. He settled back, cradling a bottle in his arms. The truth was that guys like Klaus and I never knew anything. Only the officers knew what was going on, not lowly soldiers like us. I never knew the exact location of the engagements I was involved in during my short participation in the Africa campaign. Later, I discovered that American servicemen on my grunt level never knew where they were either. Well-disciplined and totally obedient, most soldiers, regardless of allegiance, had confidence in their officers. We were no different. Cogs in a war machine, we clicked along with the Axis plans and schedules. My curiosity about German strategy in the Africa campaign was not satisfied until I researched it many years later. When my replacement unit had arrived six months before to join the motorised infantry regiment, the 47th Panzer Grenadiers, the commander congratulated all of us on becoming a part of the 22nd Panzer Grenadier Division, formerly the 22nd Infantry Division, motorised. This division, stationed on the island of Crete, Greece, only had my regiment as part of the Africa campaign. This regiment was not deployed until early 1943 in Tunisia. The commander, Colonel Boussa, was under Corps Gruppe Weber in the campaign between February and March of 1943, and again in the final German offensive in northern Tunisia with Corps Gruppe Weber in May of 1943. Originally, my regiment had been formed from men in northern Germany, including my state, Schleswig-Holstein, and also Hamburg and Lower Saxony. Now my regiment had done its duty against the Allied offensive and had suffered accordingly. I look back and see myself squatted among opened cans of food, doggedly stuffing another bite down, a tired, edgy private with dark blonde hair in need of cutting, wearing the same smelly, dirty uniform I had worn for three weeks. When we fled along the tracks to escape the enemy breathing down our necks, I felt empty and confused. I couldn't understand that after months of knocking myself out to keep up with unseen plans and unpredictable schedules, I was suddenly swept up in an unthinkable, unorganised mass retreat. My mind couldn't grasp what would happen in the next minute, let alone in the more distant future. Word got around that evening that surrender was being negotiated for the next day. Each man who repeated it looked as if the wind had been knocked out of him. This is the end of us, Klaus whispered to me. At least we don't have to fight any more, I answered. Don't worry, said some idiot, obviously not on top of things. Germany is going to win and we'll all be heroes. At that point, it seemed impossible to me that Germany could fight on for several more years. But Hitler wasn't ready to give up, not by a long shot. Quick as a lightning strike, an officer brought us to attention. Orders rang out. All weapons, vehicles and anything else useful to the enemy must be destroyed immediately. My heart sank. This could only mean that there would be no rescue. We faced imminent capture. Fireworks of our destroyed armaments lit up the sky. The air thickened with the fumes of sulphur and cordite. Hands shaking, I felt around and, in one of the flashes of light, I found my rifle. I knocked it against a tree and broke the stock. Defenceless for the first time since hitting Africa, I sank down and leaned back against a tree. The tension from that last order ebbed away. Uncertainty took its place. Men's voices echoed across the silence of a night lit by bonfires of burning weapons. Comments and ideas about our strange situation were tossed back and forth. 
I listened, trying to make sense of it. When we had landed, we were convinced that we were the best trained, best led, best equipped soldiers in Africa. What went wrong? Terrifying scenarios of what would happen to us as POWs were a common theme. Soldiers old enough to remember World War I compared that war to this one. Men speculated all night, sounding sad and depressed or discouraged and confused. Surges of anger rose to the surface. With typical adolescent scorn, I thought they had it all wrong. We'd been through hell already, how much worse could it get? I was one ex-soldier grateful to God to be alive. Later on, I learned that a two-pronged Allied offensive led to the surrender of not just my unit, but also the entire Deutsches Afrika Corps, DAC. The DAC, under Field Marshal Erwin Rommel, the Desert Fox, had been engaged in Libya under Italian command against British forces. Then Armee Gruppe Afrika formed to counter the invasion of American and British forces in Morocco and Algeria. Rommel joined Col, Genner Jürgen von Arnim to pit their two armies against the Allies in Tunisia. The Allies had air supremacy and an overwhelming supply of vehicles, ammunition, food and fuel. They simply overpowered the Axis armies. Now we, the Axis soldiers, had no choice but to wait for dawn and for the inevitable. Shortly after daylight, with the last of the fires smouldering their goodbyes in the Tunisian sky, the commander of the DAC sent a last message to German headquarters in Italy, Air Marshal Kesselring, and the supreme command of the army. All ammunition expended, arms and equipment destroyed. In accordance with orders received, the German Africa Corps has fought itself to the condition where it can fight no more. The German Africa Corps must rise again. Heya Safari. Drive ahead, Bantu Kramer, General Commandant, May 12th. 1943. In one fell swoop, General Kramer surrendered the entire remnant of the Africa Corps and the Armee Gruppe Africa, a total of more than 100,000 men, to the Allied command. I didn't hear about the speech of surrender until much later. Despite the talk among many of our soldiers about the promise of a German victory, at the time all we knew was that our battles were over. At Cape Bon, the Allies surrounded us. We heard them coming. Our non-commissioned officers organised the men. Our sergeant shouted, On your feet! Get into parade formation! If you've still got weapons, get rid of them first. They'll shoot you if you have a weapon. From the dunes around us, the roar of American all-terrain vehicles closed in on all three sides. Weapons trained on us. Loudspeakers blared in poor German. Put down your weapons. Put your hands on your head. No talking. Stay right where you are. I did exactly as I was told. Klaus stood next to me and did the same. Weapons raised, fingers on the triggers, the enemy came into our midst. The sharp, acrid stench of sweat mixed with fear rose from the ranks of our brave but unarmed soldiers. For the first time, I saw an American up close. Amazingly, he looked much like Klaus. They could have been brothers. I didn't know what to expect when a G.I. approached me with his gun drawn. Another surge of adrenaline made my heart pound so hard I could hear it. My fight-or-flight mechanism went cuckoo. It was all I could do to hold still and to not defend myself. I knew instinctively that this was my most dangerous moment as a captive. One false move and I would be shot. The guard patted me down for weapons and motioned me toward a line of enlisted men. After the search, I felt numb. Time stood still. Everything close seemed to be happening far away. Visions of my mother and my home appeared before my eyes and vanished. I kept my mouth shut. We were told to remain silent, presumably to keep us from organising against our captors. I doubt that anyone considered it. Then an American NCO yelled, Speed it up. Move those krauts out on the double. The Americans immediately put the remaining four S's of the Geneva Convention, Article 2, into effect. After searching for weapons, they segregated us by nationality and rank. We were safeguarded from mistreatment by our captors, silenced, and sped to the rear. 
They organised us into formations of approximately a hundred for the march into captivity, to a camp near Tunis. My formation took up at a fast clip. Unaccountably, I suddenly had to sit down. Once I did, I struggled to get up again. I couldn't stay there. For all I knew, my captors shot stragglers. I was not about to find out. I can only assume that up until then, the adrenaline of the battle and survival had numbed me. Now, in the relative safety of captivity, every raw muscle and nerve ached and throbbed, from the inflamed, bleeding shrapnel wounds on my back to my swollen, bleeding feet, which looked like raw meat. The last few weeks of forced duty in the infantry had taken their toll. Even my scalp hurt from wearing my helmet for what seemed forever. The May sun, glaring in the African sky, burned my skin. I hobbled along like an old man, feeling feverish and dizzy. Klaus, shuffling along, muttered, I feel too sick to walk much farther. I'm afraid I might have dysentery. A bedraggled soldier behind me whispered in passing, Don't try so hard. The Americans have lots of trucks. On the verge of collapsing, Klaus plopped down on the side of the road. I joined him. I just didn't care anymore. An US Army truck lumbered up and a guy leaned out, shouting, Hey, Krauts, want a ride? Yes, please thank you, I said in English, amazed that I had responded so politely to someone I would have had to try to kill the day before. I helped Klaus to his feet. We crawled up into the back of the open bed truck. Soon, from my vantage point, I got a good view of what was in store for us. A makeshift prisoner of war compound had been hastily erected with concertina wire. On the level coastal plain, giant loops of barbed wire spiralled, encircling an area big enough to contain thousands of men. Once inside the wire, Klaus and I limped towards the German NCOs, who shouted orders, attempting to organise the men. In addition to the thousands the Allies had rounded up, thousands of other Axis soldiers had run out of gas and ammunition and poured in on their own volition. PUWs pedalled up on bicycles. Soldiers who still had gas for their trucks waved white flags as they drove into the barricade. Hundreds of thousands of German and Italian soldiers eventually filled the compound. Ragged cheers went up when U.S. Army trucks dumped cases of U.S. C. Rations and water in jerry cans over the wiry. The term jerry can seemed comical to us. The 20 litre cans had originally been manufactured in Germany to store water and gasoline. The British copied the cans and called the cans what they called the Germans who produced them jerrys. The Americans called the cans jerrys, but they called us krauts from sauerkraut, our name for preserved cabbage. At that point, we couldn't be picky about what we were called. As cheers about the food grew closer, I struggled to my feet once more. I couldn't push my way through the crowd. I was too worn out to wrestle for my share. Food and water were on everyone's mind, and the strongest and fittest got it all. Klaus and I had to wait for scraps. Months later, in a POW camp in Hearn, Texas, I saw a picture in Life magazine of that makeshift prisoner of war camp near the African coast, with the caustic caption, Supermen the morning after. Talk about putting salt in the wounds. By nightfall, sarcastic German banter began afresh as we listened to the news. Some men still had radios and turned them up for the rest of us. The newscast glorified the Africa cause while we sat in total defeat behind barbed wire. Are they crazy? Klaus said. How long does it take for them to get the message? Let me tell it. News bulletin. The Africa Corps were winning in Tunisia, but quit when they ran out of ammunition and gas. Youth has its upside. I, for one, thought things could be worse. At least the rains have stopped, I pointed out, always the optimist. Otherwise we'd be lying in cold mud up to our eyeballs. Yeah, but when it was cold, the darned black flies weren't here to bite us, said Klaus. Hey, you heroes, listen to this, said a guy with a radio. He turned it up louder. Our soldiers, the German broadcaster proclaimed, defended their positions with bare bayonets after they ran out of ammunition. Oh, really? 
With my bare bayonet, I attacked a can of peas, I joked to Klaus. In between making caustic remarks about our so-called heroic deeds, Klaus started talking seriously about our future. The older men gravely told us, the Allies' next move will be to send us to permanent POW camps in other countries. Boyishly exuberant and naive, I got excited over the prospect of leaving Africa. I'd had enough of the Dark Continent. My expectations of serving in the highly touted Africa campaign had been destroyed like the tanks we left behind. I couldn't let myself think about the fallen buddies I had helped bury. Why did this happen? How did we fail? I couldn't help but think about events that had thrust me into this situation. Throughout most of my young life, the Nazis had glamorized war in films and songs. Hitler's speeches convinced most of us that winning glory for the fatherland was our ultimate goal. I was drafted into the German army at Ratzeburg. With the invincibility of youth, I said my first goodbye. My relatives, neighbours and friends threw a farewell party for me and tried to be cheerful and supportive. They followed me to the train station. Tschüss, tschüss, they cried, waving hankies. My father a World War I veteran, cautioned me. Pay attention. Don't let your mind wander for one second, and don't volunteer for anything. My uncle Honey was an intellectual who had always cautioned me about the Nazis. He said in a quavering whisper, Don't talk about anything controversial. My mother, whom I loved with all my heart, said, I will pray for you every night and write to you every week. I held back tears. At least we knew where I was headed. My unit was assigned to Tunda, Denmark. My mother had been born in that area. Prized for its superior agriculture, it had been fought over like a prize for years. My father thought my basic training assignment ironic. He answered my first letter with a joke. Now you are a German soldier occupying your mother's homeland. I came from a family of history buffs. My father and Uncle Hanny reminded me that this area had reverted back to Denmark after the League of Nations, the forerunner of the WWE United Nations plebiscite, in 1920. Schleswig-Holstein had bounced back and forth like a tennis ball. Danish rule, given up to Austria and Prussia after the War of 1848, shared until Prussia defeated Austria in 1864 then declared a Prussian province, with Schleswig as capital. Now, in the most recent match, German forces had invaded Denmark two years before, without a fight. By the time I got there, we were sharing barracks with Danish armed forces and saluting their officers. The official German line was that we were there for the protection of Denmark. However, we soon learned that the Danes were not threatened by anyone but us. Basic training really did coincide with occupation duty. When I first entered the military, I thought I would like the adventure, but I soon discovered that the army's perfectionism over uniforms, boots, beds, lockers and shaving techniques aggravated me. Training bored me. Standing guard at night in a little wooden hut annoyed me. Even though I knew that a British commando could sneak up, I fell asleep on my feet every time I had guard duty and woke up with a jerk when my rifle clattered against the boards. At my best, I was just an average grunt. Our outfit was moved to several cities, probably to give the Danes the impression that we had a lot more German troops there than we actually did. We were in a part of Denmark with a large German-speaking population. Although Danes called it Southern Jutland, we called it North Schleswig. Germany was clearly in control. During basic training, I made two new friends, Marcus and Dieter. As part of our stint in Denmark, we were given some strange duties. Night alerts rousted us out of bed to hunt down British agents dropped by parachutes. Marcus and Dieter and I would groan every time they told us British spies were out there. If we catch a Brit, will they give us a medal? Marcus asked the first time out. No, but they'll probably make sure you go on every alert, Dieter said with a laugh. I need my sleep, I whined. We were never successful in any captures. On another occasion, in my training occupation duty, I was assigned to the funeral detail of a volunteer Danish Waffen-SS man killed in action in Russia. 
SS stood for Schutzstaffel, or Protection Unit. Germany had set up volunteer SS units in countries with populations considered Nordic or Aryan. A Northland division had been formed from Norwegian and Danish volunteers. Similar units had been formed from volunteers in the Netherlands and Belgium. For the fallen Dane, we had to do a slow goose step in the funeral parade, something not taught or practised by draftees during wartime. The ridiculous step gave us Charlie horses that night. Ach, ach, ach. We had to jump out of bed and hop around to relax the muscle cramps. One good thing about being stationed in Denmark was the abundance of good food. Marcus, Dieter and I could hardly believe our eyes. Coming from heavily rationed wartime Germany, we eyeballed the shops and stores full of high-quality food. On our first weekend passes, we examined the store windows deliriously as we strolled past magnificent ice cream parlours, glorious bakeries and sparkling clean butcher shops. Lace curtains and flower boxes lured us into an ice cream shop with tiny wooden tables and chairs. This looks wonderful. Let's go inside, I said. My friends and I hadn't had ice cream since we left home. I ordered a big dish. Marcus and Dieter did the same. Did you see those shops? We can buy a lot of good food for our parents and send it home, Marcus said. But I heard the rules. We can only send one parcel per man, Dieter groused. There's got to be a way to do it, I said. We'll think of something. We watched Danish girls and boys our age, comfortably dressed in civilian clothes. I felt twinges of envy. They didn't seem to have a care in the world. They clowned around and acted as if we weren't even there. Dressed in our German uniforms, Marcus, Dieter and I didn't fit into the peaceful setting. Each day of basic training taught us more elements of warfare, more duties, more responsibilities. From the age of 13, we were marched and drilled. I realise now that we never had the chance to have a normal adolescence. Opportunities melted away like the last drop of ice cream in my dish. I guess the girls here don't like us, Marcus said. I can't get a smile out of any of them. That's not nice of them. We're here as their protectors, Dieter chimed in. If we were dressed in our clothes from home, I bet they'd be friendlier, I said. Hey boys, by the way, I figured out how to help feed our families back home. Our small pay in Danish kroners prevented much generosity, but I had managed to tuck some money in the German postal system back home. When buddies in my unit went on leave to Germany, I had them withdraw money for me. Using my account book, they could withdraw from my account at any post office in Germany and bring the marks back to me. No one ever let me down, even though they knew it was strictly forbidden to use German marks in Denmark. My buddies understood, since they wanted to help feed their families too. Many Danes who were ethnically German accepted German marks for their goods. At 18, I didn't stop to think about the punishment for my cellar or me. I paid Dabla the regular price. I bought all the food I could with the illegal marks for my family and sent it home when someone went on leave. I finished basic training about the time America launched Operation Torch and invaded North Africa. Germany was fighting the Allies on all fronts. My drill sergeant, Hans Nielsen, took me aside for some reason and told me I should choose Africa over Russia for my tour of duty. He may have appreciated that I was cheerful and a quick worker. He may also have noticed that I was hyperactive and uncoordinated, talking all the time and bumping into things. I was the joker in any gathering of guys. My bunch got a few laughs by calling attention to my ears and nicknaming me Antenna Ears. Sergeant Nielsen, a father himself, also might have been concerned because I had been slow to mature and still looked like a little boy. The sergeant, a native of Hamburg, which was close to my home, had served in the military since the outbreak of World War II. His piercing blue eyes, straight blonde hair and muscular physique gave him the look of an Adonis and he was greatly admired by his troops. His confident manner was respected by every rank. He had participated in the Poland campaign as well as the Russian winter campaign. He wore the Iron Cross, Second Class, and the Verwunderten Abzeichen, similar to the Purple Heart. 
He had also been decorated with a Russian winter campaign medal, dubbed the Frozen Meat Decoration. He painted, in graphic detail, the picture of widespread frost-related injuries and amputations suffered by German soldiers poorly outfitted for the cold climate of Russia. Ericsson, go to Africa, you'll be much better off, Sergeant Nielsen said. At least the weather there is nice and warm. But I really want to be in a motorcycle unit in Russia, I said, disappointment sticking in my throat. You crazy kid, you don't know how lucky you were when they kicked you out of the program. His blue eyes blazed with intensity. Lucky, I blurted out. It was the worst day of my life. My ignoble expulsion from the glamorized motor unit still smarted. I was mad at myself for having missed the opportunity. Thrills and adventure were guaranteed. Motorcycle drivers relayed messages over vast territories in Russia that were held by German forces. I had signed up, knowing that I qualified for training because I fit the minimum height and weight requirement. Plus, my eyesight was excellent. The same couldn't be said for my reflexes. I overreacted, overcompensated, oversteered, and crashed two motorcycles by hitting the wrong controls at the wrong time. My trainers gave up on me. Sorry, kid, one of them told me. You're too nervous. Sergeant Nielsen took me aside and tried to make me understand what was still happening to ground troops in Russia. He told me that partisans loved to ambush motorcyclists by stringing hidden wires across lonely roads. I peppered him with questions. Once I got the whole story, I no longer felt bad about washing out of the training program. I accepted his wisdom and applied for Africa. When my orders came for Africa, my heart stopped in my throat. I had been assigned to an anti-tank unit. No, not another driving test. Luckily, everyone in the unit learned to drive the vehicles by practicing on a circular track until they were ready to take the test. So all I had to do was to start the vehicle and shift it into forward gears. There was no need to learn how to reverse gears and back up. When my turn came, my buddies stood by the track and shouted encouragement. You can do it, antenna ears. When I made the trips around the track without mishap, I was elated. I proudly joined the others who passed and got my war driver's license. The next step in qualifying for the Africa Corps was to pass the physical, a tropical fitness examination. The standards were severe. You had to be physically strong and in perfect health. Your vital signs, such as blood pressure, heart rate, circulation and muscle tone, had to be perfect. Your hearing and eyesight had to be at least average, but preferably above. You could not have any chronic medical conditions. I was happy when I heard I had passed the exam. A sergeant told me to await orders to proceed to the medieval northern German city Lübeck, to a camp where we would be outfitted for Africa. Lübeck was a favourite place of mine, with its fanciful town gate and landscaped parks. But by the time I got there, the city of my memories was in tatters. Much of it was destroyed by fierce British air raids. Yet life went on there, as it did elsewhere in bombed-out German cities. My name was on the roster of soldiers to be shipped out to Africa, but I had two weeks before we were scheduled to deploy. After being cooped up in Denmark, I needed fun and excitement. On our first day in camp, I looked around for thrills. Our sergeant outfitted us with uniforms and equipment. He showed us to the barracks and told us that a whistle would sound at mealtimes. The whistle also blew for drills and duties every day. Our sergeant ended his remarks when he said, You will get weekend passes to Lübeck for good behaviour. Now, let me make my next rule very clear. You must not wear the Africa Corps uniform until I tell you to. You will put it on the day you leave for North Africa. I gathered from that little speech that British spies were not supposed to know when our platoon of replacements would land. How overly suspicious, I thought. Where in the world could a spy hide in Germany? As soon as we got inside our barracks, Marcus, Dieter and I started laughing. They were treating us like men instead of boys for a change. I tried on my new uniform. It made me believe that I actually belonged to the exotic Africa course. 
we threw coats over our uniforms and sneaked into the washroom to get a glimpse of ourselves in the mirror. We didn't see our smooth baby faces. We just saw the uniforms. Boy, did we look intriguing. If this didn't impress the girls, what would? I'm sick of all this marching and drilling, I blurted out. What do you say we head for town? Dita whispered. You can't do that, you don't have a pass. What's the worst that can happen to us? Marcus asked. The stockade, you idiot, Dita hissed. He brought out the daredevil in me. I'm going to town, and I'm going to wear my new Africa Corps uniform. I put it on and buttoned my regulation army greatcoat over it. So am I, Marcus said, as he hastily fastened the belt. I turned around and saw a few other guys in our barracks doing the same thing. Dita was such an old lady. When the dinner whistle blew, we joined what appeared to be a small expedition to Lübeck. We jumped out the windows, slurped down the so-called dinner, backed away, and ran for the streetcar. Once we got to Lübeck, we paid for another, better meal. The meals couldn't come close to the quality in Denmark, but at least we were full and we got out of drills and duties. Marcus and I took off our coats and tried to show off for the girls. They were definitely unimpressed. Obviously, we weren't the first boys to sneak into town wearing Africa Corps uniforms. Since girlfriends were out of the question, we went stag to movies and concerts and sneaked back to the barracks in the dark. I got by with these pranks so easily that I was convinced I could get by with anything. My home in Kiel was only 49 miles away from Lübeck. I knew I wouldn't get a pass for that distance, even if I asked for it. Impulsively, I told Marcus that I was going home. He had the same idea. Let's not tell Dieter. He'd never try it, but he'll figure out where we've gone, Marcus said. I have to tell Dieter, I protested. Someone has to call me when we get orders to ship out to Africa. I could almost smell my mother's cooking. I rented a bicycle and pedalled the 49 miles, which included the towns of Plon and Otin, to Kiel by the sea. About half of the distance from Plon to Utin is known as the Holstein, Switzerland, because of its hills. After about 25 kilometres of pedalling uphill and then holding tight as I coasted downhill, I began to have second thoughts. I was getting sore and tired. But by now, I was AWOL. At least I'm not on a train or bus, I told myself. German military police would have found me for sure. They were known as chain dogs, because they each wore a chain around their necks, with a metal shield in front on their chests. Although the jokes about the chain dogs among sarcastic German army men were hilarious, having them in your face was not. As I pumped up the hills and coasted down, I flip-flopped between terror about getting caught and the excitement of being home with my family. I didn't even know where they were living. Since I had never seen their apartment, I tried to picture where their building was located. Average Germans during that era didn't have telephones. You had to place a call where you knew they would send a messenger and vice versa. Through letters, I knew that my family had found an apartment near the harbour so that they could finally leave the suburban cottage they shared with another family. Although I was happy that they could finally have some privacy, I was worried. They were in even more danger of being bombed than they had been in our old apartment, because the new one was across the street from one of the biggest shipyards in Germany. That was probably the reason why they were able to get the apartment assigned to them. It overlooked the harbour. The cool Baltic breeze and the tangy smell of salt air soothed me as I coasted down their block. I found their apartment easily. It was one of the few left standing. I rang their doorbell. When my father answered, his blue eyes widened with surprise at seeing me. When he learned that I was not on leave, I thought he'd have a stroke. Are you crazy? he hissed through clenched teeth. His eyes now blazed blue flashes. A policeman, as well as an ex-soldier, he recognised the seriousness of the situation. Do you realise what you've done? What's the problem? I snapped back. I had left as a boy of 18, only to return after a few months as well. A man of 18. My father wanted to conceal me in the cellar. He knew my AWOL status would cause shockwaves in our entire apartment building. 
After all, I was the son of a respected law officer. I left a telephone number with one of my buddies back in Lübeck in case anything comes up, I explained hastily. I tried to assure him I wasn't the only one taking unofficial leave. My buddy Wiz went home to Poland. My family seemed terribly uncomfortable and acted strange around me. Looking back, I realise how hard it must have been for them. They had already said goodbye and adjusted to my absence. Now they would have to go through it again. We were a subdued lot as my family went about their usual tasks, and I helped my mother around the house. She was already making trades and purchases for Christmas meals and gifts. I caught my father looking at me several times before he covered up his sentiments by launching into more advice about doing the right thing at the right time. He was bold, brash, a man's man. As a parent, he was strict. I always knew that he considered me a sissy. He knew better than anyone that I was a reluctant soldier. He emphasised that I was an adult and that I must stop acting like a child. He told me again about his own exemplary behaviour as a soldier in World War I. I listened with half an ear. Yeah, yeah, I thought. That was you, but I'm not you. I lit a cigarette for the first time in front of my father. I tipped back in my chair, blew out a puff of smoke and said, I made it through basic training, didn't I? I'll be okay. God in heaven, my father exploded. The boy doesn't know a thing, he complained to my mother, talking about me as if I wasn't there. The boy won't listen to me. Haney, please listen to your father, mother pleaded in her sweet voice, as she always did. My father was tough man with dogged determination, his emotions kept deep inside. Whether he inherited these personality traits, or whether World War I made him that way, I will never know. I do know that I found myself taking on his characteristics more and more as I became a soldier and then, later, as a prisoner. Perhaps they even saved my life. After about a week at home, Dieter called and I got his message. We're leaving tomorrow. You better get back on the double. I felt a tug at my heart. When would my family and I see one another again? My parents probably wondered if not when they would ever see me. Mother hugged me tightly, hiding her tears unsuccessfully behind my back. Have a safe journey, dear Heine. Write us when you get to your new post. My uncle Hanny had lived with us for as long as I could remember. A tender, reclusive soul, he couldn't stand to go through the goodbyes again. He stayed in his room. My father, who knew far more than my mother about the battles to come, stood as tall as his five-foot-five height allowed and barked, Hey no! You will come back to us, son! And don't you dare get arrested on the way back! If I had a car and a driver, I'd take you there just to make sure you get back on time! You make me crazy with worry! You know what'll happen if you get caught, they'll put you in a penal battalion, or at the very least ship you to Russia. I realised that my impulsive act could get me in serious trouble. Although I had barely recovered from my first bike ride, I mounted the thing again and headed back fast. Dieter waited for me at the gate. After I skidded in, he briefed me. Thirty percent of the guys missed roll call. They noticed that you weren't here either. You have to report to the captain. That figured. Still, I was relieved, because I knew that the captain was a gentle, elderly World War I veteran. I hobbled into his office and stood in line with all of the other AWOLs. When my turn came, I saluted, introduced myself, and stood stiffly at attention with my pot, my steel helmet, on my head. The captain's faded blue eyes looked at me under a wrinkled brow. You have broken a code of honour. You have let your unit down. What would have happened if this base had been attacked? I hung my head and tried to look ashamed. I'm truly sorry, sir. It's just that my family is so close that I couldn't let the opportunity to see them once more slip by. He clucked his tongue in sympathy, letting me know where he really stood. Since you're shipping out tomorrow, nothing more will come of this. Thank you, sir, I said as I saluted, turned on my heel, and exited. Saddle sore and weary, 
I lurched over to my unit. The guys were packing up their military gear and heading out. I threw my stuff together and ran after them. Come on, antenna ears, hurry, they shouted. I couldn't keep up. My legs were buckling. Man, you're weak. What's the matter? Couldn't pedal over a couple of hills? Marcus laughed as he pulled me along. Dieter boosted me into the railway car. We travelled the typical German way, in the freight cars of trains. Each car had bunks installed and a stove in the centre. Heaps of straw made the floors more comfortable for sitting. We made it aboard just before the train pulled out.